Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Let me get on. There we go. Good morning. We've been working on this, uh, on this, all of the machinery up here and our sound system. Do I sound better today? I'm sounding louder. 
Okay, let me pull this down. Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Okay. Oh, you're picking at me. Okay, that's all right. Well, we're going to begin with the reading of the Word of God together. And the, uh, and, and the title for this section is Majesty and Power. And I will read the, a lighter, uh, the lighter text and the congregation will respond with the darker text. <clears throat> the earth is, is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. May God add to the reading of his word. Brother Joy is going to lead us in prayer now. Come on there, buddy. Before I uh, pray... Uh, I do want to mention that this, uh, as a Southern Baptist church, uh, we support our missionaries. We don't just support them around the world, but we support them here at home and our church planters that we have in a lot of locations around our country. Uh, and this month, uh, Kevin and Rebecca Gibbs are some church planters that are out in Seattle, Washington. Now, if you know anything about what's going on in Seattle, Washington right now, you'll know that when you're planting churches out there, we, we need to keep uh, those people in prayer. Uh, and, and they are uh, at a place called Discovery Church. And just to give you a little bit of a, of a stat line on this, there's almost 5 million people in the metro area there in Seattle, and 84.6% of them are estimated to be lost. So they have their work cut out for them, and, and they have a great opportunity out west to, to share the gospel with a lot of people. And it'll make a huge impact. And so we need to remember them this morning. So as I say a prayer, I'm going to remember them. Uh, and that's the Gibbs family. And this week, as you uh, pray, keep them in your prayers this week. Sure. Yes. I sure will. We'll, we'll pray for Dexter. We sure will. Yeah, let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we just come to you this morning. We just lift up so many people who have ailments and have uh, stuff going on, even from this virus, Lord. We just lift them up and uh, have them uh, healed, Lord, and just put your hand on them. Lord, we just pray for Dexter this morning and his eye problems. Lord, we just pray that you just uh, lift him up and comfort him and just heal his eye. Just uh, give him the peace during this time uh, of uncertainty, Lord. Uh, we pray for the Gibbs family as they start their church uh, in Seattle, Lord. We just uh, lift them up this morning. Just ask that you just give them strength and wisdom uh, as they lead people to Christ for you. We pray for uh, this community uh, as we start this new year. We just pray that we just put our eyes on you and trust in you and everything that we do and everything that we say. Be with us this morning during our hour of worship and just uh, put our hearts where they need to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, just a few announcements that I want to uh, talk about here this morning. 
Uh, we do have VBS that we're going to try to plan this year, so we need to start praying about that. We'll be uh, making some announcements on that uh, pretty soon. Uh, so just keep that in prayer. Uh, we also have the pastor's breakfast. Now, I haven't eaten his cooking yet. So we may need extra prayer. I don't know. I do. Are we going to need extra prayer, Brother George? Or are we good? Are we good to go? We good? <laughs> Uh, it, man, we, everybody's just picking on you this morning. I'm sorry, Brother George. I couldn't help it. But uh, <laughs> pastor's breakfast this, this is Friday, uh, and uh, it's going to be at 8 o'clock. So come here for that. That's open to everybody that wants to come. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be a good time and, and some good food, I know. Uh, we're having an open gym also this Saturday for the kids and the youth. Uh, the only thing that we're asking is the youth and the kids that are coming, we've, we've given them liability forms. If you could just please fill those out, uh, and that way if something happens uh, and, and we need uh, that information, uh, we've got it right there available uh, to us. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. That's going to run from 9 till noon uh, this Saturday. So we're just opening up the gym and have a good time for fellowship and just uh, be with the kids in our church. Also, there's a, a very nice letter uh, from Barbara Baldry's family. Uh, of how much they appreciate all the kind words and the kind gestures and the food and the different things that uh, people in this church uh, help them with during a tough week. Um, and we want to keep and remember them in our prayers uh, as, as they're, they're getting over the death of Miss Barbara. Uh, she'll be uh, certainly missed, and uh, we, we love that family. We want to keep them in our prayers. Um, other than that, is there any other announcements that anybody would like this morning or need? Uh, yes, yes, we need to keep Miss Donna in our prayers too uh, as, as she's battling this COVID also. All right. In that case, I'm going to turn it over to Brother George. Okay, Tori. Am I on? No? Okay, very good. Well, let's take our hymnals now, and we're going to start with the wonderful hymn, We Have a Story to Tell to the Nations. And this is going to be verses 1 and 4. It'll be on the screen. If you'd like to use the hymnal, it's hymn number 586. We have a story to tell to the nations. We have a story to tell to the nations. That shall turn their hearts to the right A story of truth and mercy A story of peace and light A story of peace and light To the dawning and the dawning to do singing praises to the Lord from another hymn, a little bit uh, newer hymn, 579 in your hymn books, Shine Jesus Shine. Now before we sing this, just a quick brief story. Um, I first heard this a number of years ago when I was serving at a church in Miami, Florida. And I remember we had the end of VBS and my secretary's little daughter sang this song, Shine Jesus Shine. And when I heard that at that time, I said, that's a song I have to have. Because that's a great, great song. It says, Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. We're going to sing all three verses of this great hymn. Oh 
Jesus is mine, verses 1 and 3. sing one more song this morning before we get to our message and this is going to be on the screen it is give thanks to be with a DVD but I just want us to be reminded that you know I know many times things happen in our lives that are not convenient that can really disrupt what we think should be happening that does not always seem fair but there's something that we can always do is thank the Lord for all that he gives us. Because if you really think about it, it's he's the one 
who makes the air so that when we wake up in the morning, we can, we can see the sunrise. He did that. He allows us to have abilities to work and to prepare things. And I will tell you this, living in a foreign country for three and a half years, in the country of Honduras, a third world country, we are so blessed here. And God gives us so many things. So as we sing this together, give thanks with a grateful heart. Sometimes our computer doesn't want to be fast. Go ahead, so you want to click on it again. I warned it. There it goes. <laughs> Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. He's given Jesus Christ, his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ. this time, our children, our, our, up to fifth grade, can go back with Miss Carol Lee for Children's Church today. And a 
it's so good to see Cameron and his family. Cameron was in my sparse class the past uh, to Wednesday, and he, what a wonderful young man. Well, this morning, we are going to be looking at a continuation in the book of Galatians. So if you have your Bibles with you, it will also be on the screen. We're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now let me just give a little bit of, um, of an explanation before we get into the text. This is a section in Galatians that's a reiteration of Paul explaining to the, to the Christians in Galatia that you do not have to become Jewish to be a Christian. So you have to understand something. A little different scenario back in the first century A.D. And that is that you have the Jewish people whom Christ came first to, to bring salvation, but also the non-Jewish people are what are called the Gentiles. And I would dare say probably all of us here would fit into that second group. <laughs> now the only one that I know that's close to all Jewish is my wife is half Jewish. So she'd be in either one. I guess she, she would get to pick. But generally, when we're looking at the first century A.D., one of the big problems was that the Jewish people said you have to believe in Christ who were following Christ, but also said, oh, by the way, you got to do all the things of the Old Testament, all of the law, so it's Jesus plus. And that was a problem. Now, in today's world, you might not be faced with a synagogue up the street coming and saying you're not a Christian because you're not doing Jewish things. I understand that, but there are other things that have been added to Christianity in many churches, which is sad to say, which has happened. And in many uh, positions of doctrine that are not really biblical. And we have to be very careful. And this is another reminder, another way that Paul is writing to these Christians in Galatia to be careful. And he's using in, this, in these few verses the concept of a child in a household and the servant in the household. Now you have to understand also in context, I would dare say, I don't think anyone here that has a servant. <coughs> Excuse me. But we all can reflect and we all can understand the concept of being a child in a household. And as we grow older, we desire as children to have more and more responsibility and, to, and that we know more and more, don't we? Now, how many of you, don't raise your hands, but just think about this. When you were a young person, let's say when you were in elementary school. When I was in elementary school, all I remember was I wanted to play. Everything was about play. We wanted to play. And, and by the way, we didn't have all the video gadgets that, that our young people today have. When I said we were ready to play, we'd get some string, we'd get a stick, we'd make bows and arrows. I know some, some people today would say, Oh, you're violent. Well, no, we, we had fun. We enjoyed ourselves. We played. Now, we would go also, I enjoyed the game room. I played, I liked the pinball machine. I actually scored the highest in one of our little game rooms locally, and I thought I was pretty cool until the next guy beat me. I, I, that didn't last long. My, that honor didn't last long. But even today, though, whether it's outside, whether it's doing uh, uh, playing games, organized sports or whatever, or whether you're playing a video game, uh, most young people, you're not thinking about all of the things that, that come to, that basically hit you when you become an adult and have to live in this world. Now, as I grew older, I remember when I started hitting teenage years, all of a sudden my parents didn't know very much. That's, I don't know. That, I don't know if that ever hit you. I, I don't know what they call that itis, but that's what I started to think. And then I remember even starting in college, very young, it's like, oh, they don't really know. This older generation, you know what, at 58, my parents knew a whole lot. And I, I wouldn't mind having them help me with some things. I really wouldn't. Uh, we figure out that it's not so easy always as we get older. Well, being a child in a household, the comparison is, is that that, that child is much like a servant. They are told by their parents what they must do in their life. And I will tell you, even if you're an adult child, it's, parents still want to tell us, and that's all right. We're still a child to, to our parents. 
Those of you who have adult children, do you still look at your children as your child? You do. Now, you understand that they are doing their own thing and they're making a living in that, but they're still our kids, aren't they? I have a young person in college. That's my child. You know, and if she hurts, I hurt. I have a child in a group home who's 24 now. I can't believe that. 24 years old, and when she hurts, I hurt. So being a child, though, it's like being under that schoolmaster that was talked about in Chapter 3, and we're similar then on the, on the plane of being a servant. You're told, both are told. But then Paul uses that and steps off from it, and he will explain about our being an heir to God, even not being Jewish, we're still an heir to God, whether you come from the idea. And, and basically, Paul here is saying, those that are Jewish, that are, that are oppressing this church in Galatia, they were considered like the children of God because they were God's children. They were this special nation. And those who were not in that, they, uh, Paul puts them in that position and following what the Jewish people would have told the non-Jewish people, you're more like the servant. You were, you were kind of out here. So you got to come in here with me. I'm the child of God. Well, God, through the writings of Paul, is going to straighten this out a bit to really give God's perspective. Now, you might say, boy, that was confusing. Well, we're talking about a different era and time, but we're still talking about an example that can be placed with us, too, because there are times in our, in our cultures and in the Christian culture where if you're not doing this or you haven't experienced this, you're less. That's not true. In fact, I will tell you this, that as a person that has never done certain gifts, because we're not promised to do all the gifts. I don't feel that I have lost out. God has given me a certain amount of spiritual gifts. One is teaching. And I've been able to utilize that gift. I don't know how good I am at it always, but I, I am able to utilize that. Pastor and servant. Those are the gifts that God has given me through the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And those are gifts that I'm allowed to use and I've been able to use. And that's joy. I don't have to do other gifts. That is not what my calling is. My calling is to utilize the gifts that God has given me. And thus, as a servant, in, the, in these words, I am now an heir to God. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Now I say that, there, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant though he be Lord of all. And then verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We do thank you for the opportunities you give us. We thank you for the, for the open doors you allow this church to, to, to go through and to minister to, to this community. And I ask, Lord, that in this message, this is a, a more difficult message because it actually focuses on a setting that is not part of our culture today. It's not part of what we would call our community, but it gives a great example on how not to let other things affect us and make us consider ourselves less of a Christian. And Lord, I ask that your words be given today and not just my own. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we start out with this idea that the Jewish nation was considered here the Jewish people that were in this community from the synagogue locally, that many of them were trying to convince the, the non-Jewish Christians, hey, you've got to do what, what, what we do. You have to go through the, all of the precepts and all of the things that we do as Jewish people under the law. But Paul, after he also comes off of other uh, of the previous chapters, explaining that you don't have to be Jewish to be a Christian. That Christ first came, yes, to the Jewish person. But secondly, he came to us too, who are not Jewish. And so we need to understand that. <coughs> Excuse me. And just a few verses earlier, in chapter 3, verse 28, Paul comes to a conclusion in that chapter. He says, but guess what? There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For we all are one in Christ Jesus. Now, that is a verse that many times has been taken out of context. What that is saying is, in God's eyes, each and every one of us here have the opportunity to become a Christian and to be called a child of the King. There is not a side for men and a side for women. There is not a side for those that are workers and that are slaves and those that are the company owners and that are the owners of slaves. No. Over the course of time. And there is no difference between the side for the Jewish people and the side for the non-Jewish people. No. We're all going to be in heaven. You all have the same rights as anyone else. The pastor doesn't have more rights than others. There's not going to be a section for pastors and a section for laity. No. We're all going to be together. And in fact, even today in the church, one of the reasons why I am a Baptist, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons, is we all are on the same level. Raise your hand if you have, if you're a church member and you have a vote in the church. Raise your hand. Okay, now, the pastor gets 10 votes, right? No! I get one vote. We all are together. This is part of what it is to be a Christian, folks. Now, how we use our Christian walk and how, how close we stay to God, now that's another story. That's up to us. And the closer you walk with God, I will tell you, the more joy you get from serving him and being in his presence. And that is great. But here, Paul starts with that even, the, even those that call themselves the children, now, now in this case, you have to understand, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, many times things were written in the male in, in, in the male gender. But this does not just mean sons. This means daughters too. This means all of us. So if you're a child, you're under tutors, you're under others, you're under the governors or those that are taking care of you. And we don't even use governors to, today in our culture for the most part. We basically, it's parents. And then our schools also help sometimes in other groups. But we generally are, are on our own as parents today. But whatever it is, as a child, you're under the auspices and, uh, and the desires of your parents, especially as young people, just like a servant would be. And so we're the same. God is saying, really, there's, no, there's not a big difference. Now, yes, there are technical aspects that, that are different. We know that as a Jewish person, your, your, uh, your tutor was the law, the law of Moses. And that's what these Jewish people were trying to oppress on the Christians who are not Jewish in this community. That you have to be Jewish. No, you don't. And I'm not, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not attacking Jewish people. No, the Jewish people are God's chosen people. But in this case, you can't take what is less, the law, and apply it and overshadow what is better, Jesus. And we know Jesus was better. In fact, hold your place here. It's not on the screen. If you can go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Let, let me just read this as you're finding it. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What this is saying is, at the beginning of starting of the book of Hebrews, the author here is saying that the word of God came through the prophets first. Now, that was pretty good. In fact, we have much of their, well, all the writings that God desired for us to have in the Old Testament. And many of the prophets said some great things. Isaiah is one of my favorite. Isaiah 53, the greatest Old Testament passage on the coming Messiah and what he would suffer. But... They are not as good as Jesus and his message and what he did. 
And also, too, it even says here that even the angels don't compare to Christ. That this is the Son of God. And for the prophets of that ancient time, guess what would happen if they met an angel? They would be scared to death. They would shake. And most of them would wonder, is it my time? Because of God sending an angel, I must have done something pretty bad. You ever thought that um, if somebody comes by and, and whether they were interested in critiquing you or not, it made you nervous? When I used to speak at the Holy Land experience, Marvin Rosenthal, the founder, always made me nervous. I'm wondering, what is he, is he going to lecture me afterwards? And I, he, I asked him one day, I said, Marv, did I do something wrong? No. Why are you asking? Because you came and sat in on my lecture. He said, no, I wanted to hear what you were saying. And then the other, the old, the other individual that used to make me very nervous was, was Paul Crouch Jr. And one time I still remember, and if I've told this story be before, it's, I can reiterate it. I was on the model of Jerusalem doing my talk. He walks in with a camera, and he starts taking pictures all around the model at me. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm speaking, you know what, this might be my last day here. <laughs> and I found out afterwards, I, I asked one of my friends who was a technician who was good friends with him, I said, well, am I done? He says, oh, no, no, no. He, he laughed. He said he, he knew you were nervous. He, he just was trying out his new camera, that's all. And you happen to be the person. What a joy. Uh, what a joy. <laughs> that made my day. But you have to understand something. That Jesus is much better than the angels. Much better than the prophets. He is the best. And when you apply the Old Testament law and say you must do this. Because Jesus isn't quite enough. That's wrong. That is false doctrine. And in today's world, if you go back to the book of Galatians, in today's world, it might not be Judaism. It might be some other thing that the world says. It might be false doctrines or corrupted doctrines or tweaked doctrines that aren't getting away from God. And you're being told, well, if you don't do this, you really aren't a Christian. Stop. That is not correct. What makes you a born-again Christian? It is knowing Jesus Christ is your Savior and he took away your sins. That is the beginning of it. Now, are there different ways of following Christ? Slightly. You might have a couple doctrines that, that, that would differ from me a little bit, and that's all right. Some of the doctrines in the Bible are not clear-cut where if it's either black or white in it. No, it's sometimes... There's not, a, there's not as much said, and we have to fill in a little bit. How we fill in many times is based on how we walk with the Lord many times, how we view the Bible. One of the great things that I've noticed early on in learning theology is that when you take a class on systematic theology, that's the systematizing of what the Bible doctrines are, you always start with, uh, with the bibliology or the study of the Bible. Why? Because how you look at the Bible and how you accept the Bible is going to dictate how you look at everything else in the Bible. And I, I, I know in, in today's world, there's many people that are standing up and saying, well, I believe in the inerrancy of the Word of God. Well, first, you better qualify that. Because some people say one thing for inerrancy and, other, and they don't mean that. I, I mean it when I say I believe in the, the inerrant Word of God. I mean every jot and tittle. Now, what is a jot and tittle? If you look at the Hebrew language, there are little tiny marks. Even they are part of the inerrant word of God in the original text. That's how I look at it. I hold it fully. But there's another part to this. And that is, is the Bible sufficient for you? Or do I have to have other things too? See, a lot of people are saying to today, many people in the ranks of Christian leadership, Oh, the Bible's the inerrant word of God, but they don't hold to the sufficiency of the Bible. That's a key issue. In fact, in my opinion today, right now, in our world that we live in, in, in the Christian realm, I'm more interested in how you look at the sufficiency of the Bible. Now, I want, I, I believe, 
wholeheartedly in the inerrancy of the Bible. And that is a major doctrine. If you can't believe this word and you think there are problems in it, where are the problems? And how are you going to trust the miraculous? That's usually what comes into play, is the miraculous gets cut out. I have sat under so many professors. I've gone to conferences where people get up and they have 20,000 degrees behind their name. They are this person and that person, and, and people look at them and they say, boy, they walked right here, let me get a picture. Or they, they shook my hand, I can't wash this hand forever. And they do not believe neither in the inerrancy of the word of God or the sufficiency. And they teach their own doctrines. What was happening here was you had this group of Jewish people who were saying, you're not sufficient enough just to call yourselves Christians because you didn't come from our faith. So you better add these things to it. So in Hebrews, we see Christ is better. Here we're going to see Christ is better. Verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, and now he's talking to, to the non-Jewish people. When we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world or the principles of the world, meaning you also, before Christ, are like children. You're under the bondage of this world. Now, for some of these people, they might have been following the false gods of Rome. They are, their lifestyle might have been very contrary to what the word of God says. And if we put it to today's world, many times people come into, in, into, Christian, into Christian walk from a very, very non-biblical lifestyle or, or not a Christian home. Now think about this. How many of us here grew up in a Christian home? You don't have to raise your hands. I grew up in a very Christian home. When I say very, I was a pastor's kid. I mean, I got away with nothing, Okay. My dad and mom, they watched me. I mean, my dad pastored. My mom did children's church. So that meant I couldn't even get out of the same room from one of my parents. That's just how it was. That's how I grew up. But it was all right. Now, at the time, sometimes I thought, boy, this is awful harsh. My friends here, they, they don't get quite as hard treatment. But you know what? It's all right. Thinking back, that kept me probably from getting in worse trouble than I could have gotten. And I had a different mindset growing up than some of my friends who became Christians later on in life. We, as, and if we didn't grow up in, the, in, in a faith, and in the case of this case, in, in the Judaism, if, or, and, and in today's world, if we didn't grow up in a Christian home, we have a very different lifestyle we might have grown up in. Alcohol use, drug use. All sorts of things, immorality that could have been around us, swirling around us in our life. And what is sin in the Bible, how it calls it, may not have been called sin in your household. And to come into Christianity, we were under those principles, just like the Jewish people of this day were under the principles, just like others are under principles, just like I was under the principles of my parents, even though I didn't know Christ as Savior. Now, early on, I did accept him as Savior. I believed my parents. I believed what I saw around me. And I saw actual Christians be, uh, living it out, which is importance of your testimony. We covered that some in Sunday school t today. We talked about our testimony, the importance of it, and it's true. The world looks at us, folks. But so what we see here is, as Paul writes, he says, the Jewish people under the law before Christ were like children that had tutors and governors. They were being tutored in the Mosaic law which was good. The Gentiles, on the other hand, also were like children who were tutored. Maybe not the same principles, but in the principles more of the world. Now, here's where we stand. We stand almost on equal ground here then. Let's continue. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come. Now, let me stop right there. The fullness of time. Sometimes God's timing is not our timing. We must understand this, that I've, I've heard people say, well, God doesn't hear my prayers. And they're, they're really, truly praying for something good, maybe salvation of a family member. I've been told this. God isn't hearing me. I'm trying. I've prayed for them for the past couple of days, and I'm trying. You know what? Sometimes it takes a lot more than a couple of days. Sometimes it takes months, years. It could even take a lifetime for praying for someone. See, it's on God's timing. 
And sometimes even in our own lives, have you ever did one of those prayers like something good could have been coming your way? You said, Lord, help me here. If you help me here, maybe I'll become a missionary in Africa someday. You ever thought that? I have had people that tell me they'll become missionaries or something like that. That's not what God needs to hear. He, uh, you know, we, we should ask for help. You know, when we do anything, whether it's an endeavor on maybe going to school, maybe picking a college to ask the Lord's you know, wisdom in this. But you don't expect every time you ask God something, it's going to instantly happen. It doesn't work that way. God has his timing. Now, sometimes it does. Sometimes people can be miraculously healed. It happens. The story of Carolee's sister that had, it, they thought it was a tumor. They were going to operate on her. And they said, let's take one more x-ray just before they started. She was a little girl. And the doctors come out and say, there's nothing there. Why is she here? There's nothing there. There was something there. Did God miraculously take it away? That's what it sounds like. Was anyone there putting hands on her and saying, it's gone? No, but they did pray. The church prayed. And in that case, God did it. I don't doubt that a bit. There are other times you, you might know someone that miraculously they were, it was looking very, very gloomy in their case. And all of a sudden, pop right back up. Is that the hand of God? Very possibly. But it doesn't always happen on our time frame. So you must understand, God's time frame can be different from us. And I know people will use the verse and quote the statement that, for God, a, a year is like a thousand years, or a thousand years is like a year. Okay, that's true. That's part of it. But God has a time frame. And he wants to do it a certain way to bring the most honor and glory to himself because he is God. And in the case of the coming of Christ, he came at the exact correct time. And as we look backwards at it, we can see that. Number one, you had the Roman Empire in charge. The Roman Empire provided roads, they provided security, they provided a false peace, but it was a peace. Number two there, there was a universal language that everybody was learning. It was called Koine Greek or Common Greek. That was the language of the land. So there was a language that everybody could read and everybody could understand the, the scriptures in. And Christ came as, he, as it was promised by the prophets in a setting where he came into it to this world in obscurity, but he was made known to all. And in Isaiah chapter 52, the end of that book, or the end of that chapter, we read that kings who have not heard the story of Jesus, they take notice because this is different. So Christ came at the perfect time. Let's continue. God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. What this means is that the virgin birth, that Christ came a special way and it was according to how the law said and the prophets said he would come. Let me continue, verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now whether, and you, you must go back to, to this, when the law was given in, in the Old Testament, whether you held to it or not, whether you were of Jewish descent or not, it was still God's guiding principles. If you could complete the law, you were righteous. And guess what? Nobody could complete the law. And in fact, there's a verse that states in the Bible that if you break one laws, guess what? One of the laws, guess what? You've broken it all. So when when people when I used to be told even working at the Holy Land experience, well, we got to worship it Saturday, and then I tried to not get into those arguments because. It was always a win for me and always a loss for them, and it didn't help anybody. But if you're saying to worship on Saturday because that's part of the law to keep it, stop. Do you eat bacon? I'll go to, I'll go to food. Do you eat bacon? If you ate bacon, guess what? You broke the law. You broke the whole law, so don't, don't come to me. Did you, I see you got a ham sandwich there. You broke the law. Sorry. Oh, you like, you like shrimp? You broke the law. You like uh, oysters? You broke the law. You like catfish? You broke the law. Bottom line, that's that. those are the easy ones to point out. That's not even the hard ones. So you've got to understand that in this case, we're seeing that 
that were that when Christ came, he was better than the law. Verse 5, or, or verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into the hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then verse 7. Wherefore, you are no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. What this says is, as Paul concludes this section, that with all of that said, that when whether people claim that there's this group and this group, whether sons, daughters, or servants, they're all the same in God's eyes. And Christ came for all. And that means for all of us. It's through the work of Jesus Christ that we have salvation. Now you might say, well, I never am going to really deal with the Jewish principles and the Jewish people. I just There just aren't that many around for me to that I see this. I understand, and I, this is why this is very. This passage is very much set in context in this time period. But the principles can be applied to us. There will be times in our lives that there will be others that might have different thoughts. Maybe even that they might be Christians and they might have just very different thoughts. But when you start adding doing things for your salvation. You got to be real careful with that because that's adding to Christ. You are saved through the work and the blood of Jesus Christ. That is it. That is what brings us to Him and what reconciles us with God. And then there is, we're all the same under Him. I leave you with this final thought. Part of being saved is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And there are five things I want to share about the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because this is, he's the one who seals us. In fact, number one, we are sealed to God through Jesus, uh, through the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ as Savior, at that moment that we are, that our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, at that very moment, we are sealed to God. That is why I believe that once you have accepted Christ as Savior, you will never sin your way out of heaven. You have eternal security. Because it's not based on me, it's based on the Holy Spirit. And if it says in the Bible that he seals us, are you going to fight against God? Because the Holy Spirit's God. Can you overpower the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. Secondly, we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, meaning that, that baptism, spiritual baptism, demonstrates that we are part of the kingdom. That doesn't happen later. It's not some event where you have a feeling. It really isn't. It happens at, at your moment of salvation. Amen. Number three, we are anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, some of the, uh, we, we are all anointed. Now, what does that mean? That, that means that when we accept Christ as Savior, we have a mission to God. Now, you might say, I don't feel very anointed. I woke up this morning. I had a headache. And I had an argument with my spouse, and my kids didn't do very good last night, and on and on and on, and the dog bit me. I don't feel very anointed. No, you're anointed. It doesn't come later on. Now, I, I know some people will pray, will you anoint this time together? I understand what they're saying, but really, we're all anointed once. We are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. All of us are. Whether you feel like it or not, you are a, a, an ambassador. And by the way, feeling doesn't isn't really needed here. And then number and then number four, we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. This is why, as a Christian, as we serve God, He brings us the joy of God into our lives. Also, too, if we misbehave against God, uh, we can we can be some of the most miserable people in the world because guess who we are taking with us doing wrong, the Holy Spirit. It's one of the most miserable people in the world is the Christian that's misbehaving. It really is. Because it's not just us in our conscience, it's also the Holy Spirit. And he can do some poking from the inside. But there is one thing that comes and goes with the Holy Spirit. And that is the filling of the Holy Spirit. And let me explain and then I'll close with this. The filling of the Holy Spirit goes up and down depending on how much we let the Holy Spirit use us. We, we, we don't get it instantly, like we don't have it and then we have it, then we lose it. No, 
it's, it's like a thermometer. It goes up and down. If we're doing things for the Lord and we're really on fire for God, guess what? That filling of the Holy Spirit gets to go up and up and up because he gets to use us more. Now, if we're not behaving well and we're taking and making some bad choices, then the filling of the Holy Spirit kind of goes down because how is he going to use us if we're misbehaving? I end with this for the reason that this whole book of Galatians is saying, is telling us over and over again that there's one way for salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ, his word. And when we accept him as Savior, and we ask him to be our Savior, we give our lives to him, it is a better way. It may not always be easy. In fact, I've been in countries where being a Christian is not something that can even be said openly. There are countries around our world that Christians are put to death. But they still take a stand for God. I think about the country of, of China. You know, they say China has a great church that's very strong. It's an underground church. And it's not so much what they do in the building, but it's what they do in society that makes them so strong because they make a difference. And it scares the government like crazy because how can they have nothing? We're taking away things and they keep doing more and more. That's a sign of true Christianity. So fellow Christian, let me encourage you. You are an heir. And as an heir, you get all of the benefits and blessings of being that Christian. So never think of yourselves as lower than others. Never shy away from saying, I'm a Christian. Because that is a great thing. That is the most wonderful thing. And fellow Christians, that's the greatest thing you'll ever do in your life. Because what you've done when you accept Christ as Savior is you've now taken a temporal time period and you've extended it to etern through eternity to be in the place and the fellowship and the shadow of God and the glories of heaven. That is so great. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We truly do thank you for all that you do for us and we thank you for this passage. Even though, yes, it's difficult and yes, does it, can we grasp this and put our arms around it totally? It's a little ambiguous being a different time period, but the principles are important to show us that we all start out before becoming a Christian like the servant or the, or the child that is under the tutor, whether it be a worldly tutor or a godly tutor. But yet when we make that step to accept you as Savior, that we are now become the heirs of you. We have been engrafted in to the lineage of Abraham, and we are called your children, and you are there for us. May we always remember this. May we never back down as in our Christian stand, may we always share of Christ with love. But may we always strive to be strong in the faith and strong for you with your principles to share your love to the world around us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to conclude with one final hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I'm going to ask Brother Jory if you'll come and lead us in the, in the music up here. I'm going to come right down front here. And my question to you today is this, is number one, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Now you might wonder, why would he ask me this that we have family members here? Well, that's true. But let me ask you this. Does membership in a church actually give you salvation? No, it doesn't. In fact, if you really look at the bylaws of this church, first you're a Christian, you're living right, and we also ask that you have believer's baptism. So it's after the fact. And I'm not saying this because I have my eye on someone and I'm judging. I'm just asking. As a pastor of, of, of God's truth, this is something I'm, I'm told you ask. Secondly, maybe you're having some struggles in life. You'd like to pray about this? I'd be happy to pray with you. You can, you can pray there at your at, on your at your seat, or maybe you don't have a church home. 
and you'd like to consider being a, a member here. I'd love to talk to you on that. Whatever God brings on your heart today, this is a short time where you can act on it. I'm going to let, I'm going to let you all remain seated because of the distancing and that. But as we sing this song, as Joy leads us, maybe you desire or you have a need to bring before the Lord. Or maybe you know someone that does. This is the time to even lift them up before the Lord in prayer. Joy. Thank you folks for coming today those of you let me get in the way so you can see me uh, those of you who are on the internet and you're watching for through Facebook live and later on through YouTube may this message uh, bring honor and glory to God and may it bring you into a better understanding on our position with God as heirs of God the Father we are his heirs with Christ and it is a wonderful wonderful thing now, a couple things before we close in prayer. Let me please uh, remind you all, Friday morning at 8 o'clock, we're going to have a breakfast here. We're going to have everything spread out. It'll be pancakes. It'll be some bacon or some sausage, and it'll be just a nice time. We might have a couple of other things with it. We'll have some juice. We'll have some uh, milk available and coffee, and it's just going to be a time. You come, you eat. I'll have a couple passages or a couple uh things with scripture like a devotion and that's it and we're done for the day and we're going to look to see to do this maybe once a month also too we're going to be um, having open gym on saturday we do need the forms filled out now let me explain if you have filled out the form you say what do i do with them bring them with you wednesday we will try to have somebody here if not by saturday to to make sure one of the documents do have to be uh, notarized and we'll get that done and then we're good to go and we're gonna see about doing this maybe once a month at first maybe then extend it to almost on a more regular basis for the youth and the children in our area we have a beautiful gymnasium here we want to use it for the honor and glory of God and we want a safe place for our children to be a part of and with all that said let's all stand and we're gonna be dismissed in prayer Brother Jordy, would you please close us in prayer today? Lord, we just come to you today, Lord, and we thankful, uh, so thankful this morning that we are heirs uh, to your kingdom, Lord, Lord, when we accept you as our Savior, Lord. And uh, we just pray that uh, as we go out of this place that we just uh, honor and glorify you in everything that we do. Uh, and just be with us, keep us safe this week so we can come back and uh, worship you again next week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.